That was fantastic. Thanks a lot. Uh, I already have questions for the panelists, but I won't abuse my uh, position. We'll move on to uh, our discussion questions. So if you'll casterize one of these big screens around, here's our, our first question. I'll just open this right up to the panelists. Anyone that wants to uh, uh, take this question, uh, uh, jump on in. Uh, if all three of you want to, if uh, one or two want to, take it away. So the most valuable player, the MVP in Manitoba politics for the year. Um, I'll, I'll say Jennifer Howard. She uh, is a very capable uh, minister. Sorry, I'm being told up here now. Um, <laughs> Jennifer Howard uh, started out, worked her way up in cabinet, had um, labor as one portfolio. It was a very quick study. I remember she was in the labor portfolio for a couple of months, and we got into a detailed debate about uh, pension assumptions and that sort of thing, pension liabilities, and she was, she was really on the ball. Given family, sorry, family services, survive that. Uh, house leader, she's probably the NDP's, I wouldn't even say probably, I think she's the NDP's best debater in question period, uh, was house leader. And uh, during especially a difficult time with the, uh, with the Tories extending the session, et cetera, last year. And, uh, and is now a finance minister. So um, she's been given a lot of responsibility and uh, is, is generally seen as one of their best performers, both uh, in debate and in press conferences and, and out in the hallway in scrums. Yeah, I would echo uh, Jennifer Howard is uh, really a premier in waiting. Um, watch Kevin Chief. I think there's uh, many people behind the scenes that uh, are saying that if, uh, if the NDP are going to go down, uh, Kevin Chief is the future of the party. And it's interesting talking with some of the senior people in the party, how um, their, their minds are with Jennifer Howard, their hearts are with, um, with Kevin Chief. And, and there's kind of the, the similarity maybe between, um, you know, a Turner and a Kretzian, in, in the sense that Jennifer Howard has all the skills. And um, I, I remember having her on political panels 15 and 20 years ago, and at that point just being wowed by her abilities, her, her, her ability to think on her feet, but also to, you know, a lot of it is checkers. She plays chess. And um, so I'm impressed with her on that. But if there is going to be a move at some point where you see more of the party rumblings publicly rather than in private conversations over a couple of glasses of wine. Uh, there is also a faction that is very much promoting Kevin Chief out there. So I'll put him on the list, and I'll also put Theresa Oswald on the list for the NDP, simply because uh, after that budget, after the cabinet shuffle, um, there were many people that I talked to said, well, now we have to go out and sell this bleep show. And uh, Oswald was one of them. And she's going out playing the soldier role as kind of being kind of a junior minister of finance, but you know, involved in jobs, going out and making the speeches. And she's quite capable as well. Um, on the conservative side, it's hard to, to, to point, but, but Pallister in, in many ways is doing what he needs to do as an opposition leader and reminding people consistently of the decision that was made. And I think it's easy, and we're still kind of letting them off easy somewhat, uh, by, by not asking him the key questions about what would you do if you got the keys. Um, and, and I do want to address some of the things later, what he's doing behind the scenes. But Pallister is, is, is still has his eye on the ball about reminding people what is wrong and, and, and keeping that conversation going. I wanted to go last because I, I was hoping you guys would say exactly what you did. Um, I totally agree that Jennifer Howard is uh, quite remarkable um, and probably a premier in waiting. Um, and on the conservative side, um, Pallister is kind of a one-man show still to some degree, so he's clearly the most valuable player on the conservative side. But I actually want to tweak the question and to like make it like the most interesting player. And that, I think, is Jamie Allen, James Allen. Um, I think he's. I think he's another guy in waiting um, who could really become. I think he already is a force in caucus, um, and he's shown himself, particularly on the universities file, um, as still a fairly rookie cabinet minister to be quite aggressive. He's won some, 
Uh, he really put the universities in their place on the grad student fee increase, but he's also lost some where he had to back down on uh, his new sort of university legislation that uh, basically ends COPSI, it's some arcane stuff. But the president's got mad, he had to back down, kind of. Um, so he's won some and lost some, but he's really, he's pretty aggressive. Um, and he's really sharp. Uh, I knew him at City Hall. He was sharp when he was a senior policy guy at City Hall. Um, he's he's forthright. Um, I think he I think he's allowed a, a certain amount of independence in his portfolio that most that you don't see Aaron Selby with um, with the most junior ministers uh, rookie not junior rookie ministers don't have. Um, and I kind of like he I kind of like that he's got his dukes up kind of on a lot of different files. And what would be awesome is if he would if he's if he's willing to go after the universities and make some changes there, it'll be interesting to see if he goes after the other bigger half of his portfolio, which is not advanced education, you know, high schools, sort of all the school boards, um, which is like really where a lot of reform has to happen, I think. So I think he is an interesting guy. Alan, by the way, <laughs> has, his, has the confidence of the Premier simply because they go way back. Uh, they've got a really good personal relationship together. And I think Jamie can, can, can act that way simply because he knows um, he's one of the few people that can, that can go out for dinner with the Premier and have a conversation with him. And, and I don't mean to be the negative about, about Premier Selinger. I, I, I like the man very much, but sometimes I have found that Premiers like to hear themselves and not others. Um, I think James Allen can, uh, can, can talk frankly to the Premier. And that certainly helps, and I think around the Cabinet table, those people that Again, it's the it's it's social dynamic that in a room, if you know that the the, the CEO and you have a relationship, you can feel confident to, to speak up and, and do some things that sometimes others don't feel as comfortable doing. Maybe can I push a little? Uh, it's it's the nature of parliamentary government that all the focus will be on Pallister as the opposition leader. But as insiders, is there someone else in the Tory caucus, a front bencher, that we should have our eyes on? Is there some sort of inside knowledge you guys can draw on? Who's going to be the finance minister, the deputy premier, if the Tories win? Hmm. Good question. Front bench strength has never been the Conservatives' uh, strength. Um, obviously, Kelvin Gertson would be justice minister, I think. Shannon Martin, brand new, like been in at the ledge for, what, like three months or something? Um, really strong, I think, it will, it is clearly a cabinet contender if they ever form government. After that, it starts to get a, you know, a little not super inspiring, to be honest. I don't know what to, what, Steve, what do you think? Well, I, I think Kelvin is the Tories' best debater, he's the best performer, he's their house leader. Uh, what What's happened to Kelvin, though, is um, he came out against Bill 18, which was promoted as an anti-bullying bill, it was more about promoting acceptance in schools and, and giving uh, uh, gay and lesbian students a, a place of safety, allowing them to set up uh, gay, uh, gay student alliances. Um, he came out against it uh, and came out uh, looking, it was, was labeled basically a, a homophobic by the NDP and that, and that stuck to him. And he had some points about how the bill fell short, how it didn't address bullying in all its forms, how it failed to enforce measures that would prevent um, uh, bullying in schools, and, and that it was a paper tiger. But the end result, I think, came out that, that cost him politically, uh, is that he came out uh, bruised from that battle, I think, more than any other battle in his time in office. So I think this past year has been a bit of a tough one for, for Kelvin. I, I think Kelvin, um, who has been around long enough, um, knows uh, uh, I've got to watch what I say here, but I'll say it. Um, that sometimes the star performers uh, get a lot of the headlines, and someone like Kelvin, who's been in the trenches as house leader, and uh, they roll their eyes at, uh, at what happens. Um, I think they're all tired and they wanted this break, but last summer was really taxing on them. Um, as far as upcoming stars are concerned, and, and I'll, I'll use this to kind of uh, uh, promote what, what's going behind the scenes in some cases, um, there's a reason why Scott Fielding is not running um, for mayor, and, and I think it was well known about a year ago that he would be running for the, the Progressive Conservatives in the upcoming provincial election. 
So Pallister's been going out trying to recruit, and he has recruited Scott Fielding. He's going to run in an area that's one of the seats that the progressive conservatives have to take in St. James, uh, and uh, has a good chance of, uh, of winning that. And I think what you are seeing, traditionally, what impressed me uh, with the NDP back in the Dewar years was that midway through session, you would see cabinet ministers go out and door knock in uh, MLA's constituencies. Um, I remember uh, Stan Struthers at my door in St. Norbert once upon a time uh, door knocking uh, three years ago, four years ago. Stan, what are you doing here? You don't, you're, you're from Dauphin. Oh, I'm just, you know, helping out the local candidate here. And what we're starting to see from the progressive conservatives is that they're door knocking in constituencies two years ahead of the election uh, in seats they know they have to win. So there's a reason why Scott Fielding came out now and said, I'm the candidate. Because he's got two years to door knock. So they're targeting these constituencies in St. James and South, uh, South uh, St. Vital, that, that southeast portion of Winnipeg. And the NDP are kind of saying to me, well, let's see if they do this during the summer, whether or not they're tired and they go off on their three-week vacation or whether or not they start door knocking. And I'm told Pallister wants people, and he's quite prepared to dump some more members of, of his caucus, those who aren't engaged and don't have the eye on the prize two years from now. Um, it's gonna get back to Ian Wishart that I've said this, but Ian Wishart's in trouble in Portage. Uh, he has a leader that does not support him. And, and Wishart knows it, I think he can hang on, but there's somebody else there that, uh, that would love his job. And why? Because Ian Wishart was once a liberal. And, and that's the streak that Pallister is this fiscal conservative, and he is focused, focused, focused. Now that could be uh, strategically very good for the NDP, because I think in order for Pallister and the progressive conservatives to win, they need the liberals to go up generally, but they also need to be able to appeal to this type of room as well. And right now they don't. They appeal to their base. So Pallister needs to kind of, at some point, realize that he's got to be more than the sum of his parts. And I'm not sure he's there yet, but uh, we shall see. So uh, yeah, so if it gets back to Wishart, yeah, call me and I can explain my sources on this one, but he knows what I'm talking about. All right, well, thanks a lot. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, the biggest rising star in uh, Manitoba politics, geez, I sort of kind of uh, covered that. We got our face on the last question. Does anyone want to add anything to this? Uh, if not, we can move on to the next one. I have one other idea for a rising star. And there's actually maybe a few of them, if Robert's here, I don't know. I've, I've been newly impressed by the Liberal back room. And it's not one person, it's no names you'd ever know, but the Liberal Party, provincially, after like a decade more than that, in it just in the wilderness and being organizationally anemic, they have a new crop of young, young lawyers, young you know re fairly experienced campaign guys who've done their time, you know running campaigns out in you know like no hoper campaigns out in Transgona and stuff, um, and they are they're actually fairly impressive as a group, um, and they orchestrated the ouster absolutely legitimately of a whole bunch of uh, marginal people in the Liberal Party not long ago, which takes some organizational skill. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, they're, I think they're quite impressive. I have no idea whether that's gonna translate into an actual bump at election time. That's a whole other ball game. But I think they've been, yeah, quite interesting as a bunch of, uh, of sort of backroom organizers. We haven't seen the Liberals with that kind of talent. Um, in, in the recent in recent years, I'll jump in on that. Um, yeah, the, the, the challenge for the Liberals is uh, money and people. Uh, they are a, a well-oiled machine. I, I agree completely with Mary Agnes compared to what they were even a year ago. Uh, there's been a big change behind the scenes. The, the whole board structure, the executive council, the leadership team uh, it has changed. They're a, a functioning party now. Uh, the problem is, is that they'll run a candidate and they'll have to get out the vote and it'll be somebody's broken down van to try to get five people to the, to the polling station. Um, 
they, they didn't raise as much money as they had hoped last year from a couple of big events, including a Jean Chrétien dinner at the Fort Garry. Uh, they're still struggling financially. They're better off than they were, but they still cannot match the ground game of the other parties. Uh, will that change in two years? Possibly, but it's, it's an uphill battle. Kevin Chief, the rising star, uh, Rana Bukhari, I still can't take seriously enough. Sorry. Why? Uh, because uh, I put her in a room with Selinger and Pallister and asked uh, some serious questions and I don't get very serious uh, answers back. Um, I, I felt, again, it's going to get back to Rana, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, the last three interviews with you, I took it easy on you. Uh, and the, the first interview that uh, we can go hard on her, on policy, on background, then I hope she'll change my mind. She, she's been getting better, Good. in my opinion. Like, Good. Interviewing her over the last, I'd say, five, six months, uh, but she, consistently. She does connect with people. I, I, again, uh, I went and I said, and I was brutal like I am right now, and I got the, whoa, 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 wait a minute. She, uh, I can connect with her a lot more than I can connect with the two old white men. She, so, she's a so, political neophyte, and she's learning policy, and she's being prepped fairly well for somebody who's paid a pittance. How many seats do they have? Hours. How many seats? Just the one. We've spent too much time talking about the <laughs> We'll spend a couple more minutes. Mary, I guess, uh, how, how, do you square, how do you square what you said um, with some of this internal discontent against the leader? Uh, are you talking about people that are associated with, with her or people uh, on the outside? No, I mean, it's, it's mostly um, leftovers is not a very kind word, but it's, that's it's sort of uh, remnants from John Gerard's time. Um, it's, uh, it's people who have joined every other party and been kicked out of those parties, frankly. Um, there are a, there was a little cabal of fairly marginal people who were raising a stink and um, either hadn't paid their dues or who'd badmouthed the leader in the past or who, you know, who, yeah, they, they, they were not credible people. And they got a little bit ink, um, you know, we all did stories about them, um, but the, the back rumors were fairly effective in orchestrating their, and it's, it's, it's not pretty, it's, it's you know, but it, for, to, be a, to be a credible functioning party, you need to have reasonable people at the helm, and I think they finally have that, and they haven't for some time. So, and that, and that is largely thanks to a bit of internal organizing. So there, were, there were some people up until their, uh, their annual general meeting in May, there were some people who were hoping that John Gerard would return and, and become leader again. And they were actively working against their newly elected leader under whom the party has risen in the polls for the first time in a decade. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much over now. The discontent seems to be gone They're much more unified in terms of who's on, on board. And the Liberal brand will uh, benefit uh, if the federal Liberal brand continues to, to do what it's doing right now and if there's a, a love affair with Justin Trudeau. That spillover will definitely be there and especially in the next federal election. What goes first, the federal or the provincial election? Federal. federal. Yeah, so there you go. You'll have that spillover effect if, uh, as expected, some liberal candidates win here federally. 